Hey guys, today I'll be talking about a game that I've changed my opinion on multiple times during my playthrough of it for many reasons. This game being the latest video game release from publisher Square Enix, Marvel's Avengers. Developed by Crystal Dynamics, the studio responsible for the most recent Tomb Raider trilogy of games. Marvel's Avengers is a game that takes beloved Marvel comic characters and throws them into an interesting blend of cinematic single player storytelling heavily inspired by the Marvel Cinematic Universe, alongside beat em up loop focused multiplayer gameplay. It was announced quite unceremoniously for such a large release, with a small teaser trailer that Square Enix decided to post on their social media accounts announcing that they had agreed to a multi-year partnership with Marvel Comics and Disney to make a game based on the Avengers IP. The first gameplay was revealed at E3 2019 to some skepticism, as it was revealed as both a single player focused story driven game, but also a multiplayer games as a service title, similar to games like Destiny and Anthem which sounded like an odd route for any AAA game to go with, let alone one based on such a beloved IP as the Avengers. Bit by bit, more and more information was revealed over the course of the year, with several War Table streams revealing the single player story content, how the game will actually play mechanically, and what makes each playable character unique, as well as how the multiplayer content and games as a service elements are integrated into the core structure of the game. The game was originally scheduled for a May 15th 2020 release date, but was delayed for 4 months with the reason given by Square Enix and Crystal Dynamics being that they believed it needed more fine tuning and polishing before release, which considering the state of the game when it did release, really makes me wonder just how bad the game was back then to require that delay. It was finally released on September 4th, 2020 to a moderately positive reception, with most critics praising the cinematic single player story, yet criticising the amount of grinding required to progress in the post story multiplayer content, as well as the general lack of polish demonstrated through several bugs and glitches found at launch. Personally, after playing well over 40 hours of the game at this point, I can safely say it's one of the most fascinating games I've played this year for both positive and negative reasons, as it attempts to do quite a lot of things to varying levels of success. It also very much feels like two separate games combined into one. What I mean by that is that when you start the game for the first time, you're given the option of playing for the single player story campaign, or loading a post story save file set after the campaign to get right into the multiplayer content of the game without restrictions with both having completely different level structures and pacing, making me think that perhaps development changed from a single player game to a multiplayer game mid development. I personally recommend doing the single player story content first, as the single player narrative is very entertaining, and gets you accustomed to the characters and everything the game has to offer bit by bit, and you'll slowly unlock bits of the multiplayer content as you progress through the single player anyway. As such, the way I will structure this review is that I will be first taking a look at the story both in terms of the main story quests, side quest chains and the post game multiplayer story content, then I'll move on to what the gameplay is like as well as how progression is handled in terms of individual character growth, then I'll move on to talking about the game's graphics and performance, followed by a brief section talking about the soundtrack and voice acting before moving on to the multiplayer content, how microtransactions and grinding factor into the gameplay, as well as a bit of info on what we know about future content for the game, and what I personally hope to see, before finally moving on to my final verdict on the game as a whole package, and the conclusion. I hope this review will be informative and comprehensive enough for you to judge for yourself whether you think you'd enjoy the game, and if you've already played through the game yourself, let me know about your thoughts of it in the comments below. I'm genuinely interested to know what you all think about the game as a whole. Likewise, if I forget to mention anything particularly important about the game that might have been worth covering, again let me know in the comments below. Now, without any further ado, let's dive right into Marvel's Avengers. <laughs> 
All right, I'm just gonna change. Wait, 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 wait. wait. The outfit is, is all about attitude. You gotta wear it like you mean it. Show me what you got. Come on, you can do better than that. Yeah, now we're talking? All right. You know what? Maybe I can help you with some upgrades for that. Gear's already spinning. Really? Yeah. Oh, and if Bruce says anything, just remind him that all he wears are super stretchy shorts. <laughs> Bruce, the kid's fine. She's tough. Kind of like her. And she laughs at my jokes. Yeah, she, uh, she grows on you. So, my first introduction to the story mode in Marvel's Avengers was through the beta a few weeks before launch, where you could play through the A-Day tutorial level and a level later on in the game with the Hulk, where you search for a hard drive containing the Jarvis AI. After finishing the beta, my initial reaction to the story was fairly mixed, and I was very unsure whether I would like the full story or not. But thankfully, I'm pleased to report that after playing for the full story mode in the final release, I can safely say it was really quite a great experience overall, and easily one of the highlights of the game for me. The game focuses on Miss Marvel, Kamala Khan, five years after the tragic events of A-Day, where a cataclysmic event occurred that destroyed San Francisco and turned hundreds of people, including Kamala, into inhumans with superpowers, with the Avengers taking the blame for the tragedy, causing them to disband. After A-Day, a secretive and mysterious technological organization called AIM is formed, led by George Tarleton, a scientist who worked with the Avengers who was present during A-Day, who promises to fix the devastation with a cure for the inhuman disease, as he calls it. Though after hacking AIM's servers, Kamala discovers that something's not quite right, especially after she is then hunted by AIM's security robots due to her inhuman status. What follows is a decently lengthy and cinematic storyline where Kamala slowly stumbles across each of the Avengers, drawing them all back into the fold to help figure out what AIM is really up to, as well as the true story behind what actually happened during A-Day and who was actually responsible for the tragedy. The story itself is mostly solid, with good writing that helps to make each of the characters shine, and overall the plot is quite compelling though it does admittedly take some time to get going, as the early section of the game where you play as Kamala drags on a little too long in my opinion, and it takes quite a while for the core gameplay of the game to make itself known. Thankfully, a few hours into the story you unlock the war table, and can start doing some of the side quest chains, which are mostly just short 1-4 to four quest long stories that task you with completing a couple unique missions with cutscenes as well as global moveset based objectives that serve as a way to get you used to a character's unique moveset and figure out if that character's playstyle suits your preferences. They're mostly entertaining but in terms of narrative depth they're fairly bare bones with only a couple of them having introduction and ending cutscenes and whilst they're themed around the core story being told they feel like little more than standard multiplayer missions with a cutscene or two tagged on to make them feel slightly different. The mission structure for the main story though is quite interesting, as a lot of the story focused missions feel very different from the core multiplayer focused missions, with a lot of them taking on more of a focus on platforming, stealth and light puzzle solving, similar to an Uncharted or Tomb Raider game. You still have plenty of the multiplayer style Warzone missions spaced in between, but they feel a lot more like filler to help pad the main story segments out a bit to keep pace of the story just right. One downside to the story I had was that even though for the most part it was solid and the dialogue and characters were interesting, some of the core characters have little to no actual character development, relying more on consumers' knowledge of the characters from their portrayals in movies and comics, rather than developing its own interpretations of the characters in the game itself. In particular, Thor and Captain America, who were the last two characters to become playable in the game's narrative, barely have any moments to shine before the story ends, Thor especially is handled pretty terribly because at least Captain America and his disappearance is one of the game's main story threads, so he at least has some involvement with the story throughout, 
but Thor just kinda shows up out of nowhere near the end of the game without any real build up and doesn't really contribute to the story in any meaningful way aside from a brief, very brief moment near the end of the game. That being said, while some characters don't quite get the love they probably deserve, the game still writes the dialogue between the characters quite well, and the campaign's central protagonist, Miss Marvel, is very likeable, with a great personality that really helps to drive the story forward, and the way the other Avengers join the party are all handled a lot better than with Thor, especially the mission where Iron Man joins the team, as you're forced to play as Tony Stark venturing through his house trying to find parts for a makeshift Iron Man suit as AIM forces hunt him down, and it's very different than the rest of the game and helps give a lot of development to the character. The game has quite a bit to offer with its story, with the main story taking from 10 to 12 hours to complete, though that does extend to about 25 to 30 hours if you do all the side quest chains and other side missions. The story doesn't really end once you finish the main scenario either, as upon finishing the game and starting the core multiplayer experience, you're met with several new objectives and story missions to take part in, focusing primarily on the aftermath of the main campaign and the continued fight against AIM. Though from what I've seen thus far, none of it has really progressed the story in any meaningful way, with only a few cinematics or unique missions, though none to the quality of the main campaign, feeling more like filler to give you something to work towards while waiting for the next core content update. It's also been stated multiple times by the developers that this is only the first part of a bigger story, with regular updates coming in the future that will add new heroes to the roster, as well as continue the main scenario narrative. That's not to say that Avengers doesn't feel like a complete game though, as the main story does have a beginning, middle and end, and it feels conclusive, with full character and narrative arcs. It's just that not all the plot threads are concluded by the end of the story, and there is a lot more to explore with the world of Marvel's Avengers that hopefully future content updates will be able to explore to a level of quality more or the same as the main campaign, though for that we'll of course have to see. In terms of boss fights, there are only about 5 different unique bosses to fight across the course of the game, two of which are just giant AIM robots that aren't particularly interesting and the other three being the Marvel villains Abomination, Taskmaster, and MODOK. These bosses are for the most part alright, but the only one that I'd actually consider good and well designed is the final boss fight against MODOK, as you're forced to switch characters for each phase of the fight, and it's the only fight that feels cinematic and unique, as the boss fights against Abomination and Taskmaster, especially when they show up as repeat fights in the multiplayer portion of the game, just feel like regular enemies that are slightly more powerful with different movesets, and are much more damage spongy. Over the course of the game, you unlock two hub areas, the Avengers Helicarrier, the Chimera, as well as the Anthill, an inhuman resistance base run by Hank Pym. These hub areas are visually unique, but both function the exact same, acting as the faction base for the S.H.I.E.L.D. and the Resistance, respectively. At these hub areas, you'll be able to buy gear from gear vendors or from faction vendors, with better gear being available to purchase on levelling up that faction. You'll also be able to get daily assignments and missions for that faction that usually amount to killing a certain amount of enemies, with the reward mostly just consisting of faction XP. Personally, I prefer the Helicarrier hub area, because you can explore each of the Avengers bedrooms, which are all decorated to suit the taste of the person staying in them, as well as enjoy some interesting conversations between the different Avengers. Overall, I enjoyed the main story of Marvel's Avengers. It wasn't anything particularly groundbreaking, but it was fun, full of the cinematic flair that you'd expect from a game focusing on Earth's mightiest heroes, and if you're a fan of the Avengers, you're probably going to enjoy the story and the characters, as it feels on par narrative-wise to some of the best that the Marvel Cinematic Universe has to offer in terms of storytelling. The single-player missions are all entertaining and feel completely different from the multiplayer missions in a good way, with unique locations both in terms of visual design as well as in level design. Honestly, the fact that they managed to make a compelling and menacing villain out of MODOK in a realistic art style, yet keeping the character's design faithful to the comics, is itself a great achievement. So yeah, the story for the game is great, and I had only a few minor issues with it, but for a video game, the gameplay is almost always the most important thing. 
So the question is, now, how does Marvel's Avengers tackle combat and gameplay? And is it enjoyable? Well, the gameplay in Marvel's Avengers mostly consists of character action beat em up combat where you are dropped into a location with a goal of kicking enemies to the curb and completing certain objectives. The single player story missions however have a bit more than just that and are for the most part the best levels in the game because of that, filled with fun platforming, awesome cinematic showpieces and light puzzle solving that help to make the levels feel interesting and diverse. Initially, the combat in the game feels fairly by the numbers in generic, with most characters having light and strong attacks, as well as ranged attacks, but as you progress with the game and unlock more and more of a character's skill set, you'll soon discover that the combat in the game is a lot more fleshed out than initial impressions gave. Each character has three full pages of skill trees, all unlocked from skill points gained through leveling those characters, and they benefit the characters in many ways, such as unlocking new types of attacks and improving a character's unique abilities. Fairly standard stuff for a game like this, and it's not doing anything really revolutionary or unique with it, but it does its job pretty well, and upgrading your characters do make them feel a lot more complex and interesting, as well as make combat a lot more fun to take part in. Though the downside to this is that you have to progress quite far into the game and level your characters up quite heavily before you can really start to enjoy each character's unique movesets, which factors heavily into the intense amount of grinding you have to do in this game, which I'll talk about in more detail later on in this video when I get to the multiplayer portion of the review. Each character also has their own different ways of traversing the environment as well, which makes them feel a lot more unique because the way you'll take on each objective is dependent on how your character approaches it. Do you approach from the sky in a blaze of glory as Thor or Iron Man, who are capable of fully controllable flight? Or do you approach on foot as Black Widow or Miss Marvel, who can grapple across terrain? It all helps to really make each character feel unique, and I only hope they can keep this level of quality when they bring new heroes to the game in the future. Of course, the game's combat isn't perfect, as even though it is for the most part enjoyable due to each character's moveset being well developed and unique, the enemies themselves leave a lot to be desired both in terms of their visual design as well as how their moveset clashes with the players in an overall negative way. First of all, almost all the enemies are damage sponges and aside from the basic grunt enemies, can't be staggered even if they have the same power level as your characters which really makes the combat feel like you're just punching a brick wall, which really isn't that fun. On the flip side, your characters will get staggered by almost every enemy attack, which is a real pain in the ass, especially since most of the enemies in the game use ranged attacks, and the game's user interface doesn't really give you nearly enough notification for when you're being shot at to be able to consistently avoid attacks, making some fights feel completely unfair and unenjoyable, especially when there's just a ton of enemies on the screen. The worst enemies though are the spin enemies that stagger you, damage you and drain you of quite a bit of your super ability gauge, which is a huge annoyance as your character's super abilities are an important part of your moveset and when you're against a huge group of enemies at once, which is quite frequent, it makes combat quite annoying. It's all worse when you factor in mission specific parameters that buff the use of certain attacks or status effects which is supposed to add an extra level of strategy or challenge to the game, but when you're downed in one shot by a basic grunt's projectile attack from far away with no warning because the mission you were on had a projectile damage boosting parameter enabled, it just feels like a cheap and frustrating for all the wrong reasons. If I die in a game, I want to at least feel like it was my fault, because otherwise it's just the game punishing me for doing something I couldn't prevent. As I mentioned earlier, each character has their own skill trees that they can unlock as they progress. However, this isn't the only method of character progression in the game, and it's where Marvel Avengers' biggest issue lie, with its gear system. Each character can equip four different types of gear at a time, that each increase the character's stats and attributes, whilst also giving the player extra buffs such as more damage when using a certain attack, or defense against a certain attack type. Each piece of gear has a power level that influences your character's overall average power level, with the ultimate goal of the game being to reach the current power level cap of 150 in order to be able to take on all of the content available in the game, 
Naturally, as you progress through the game completing objectives, you'll be obtaining new gear that will hopefully be greater than the gear you've currently got equipped. But the problem with this system lies in the fact that it's just not fun to do, as none of the gear has any cosmetic value and only serves to increase a fairly mundane stat value, and to make it even more monotonous, the multiplayer missions for the most part seem to scale with your power level, so you never actually feel like you're getting stronger, especially since you'll most likely be challenging missions with higher power levels than your own in order to acquire better gear, because from my experience, higher level gear doesn't really tend to drop when you're doing a mission on the same power level as you. It's also probably the reason why all the enemies in the game feel like damage sponges, and it really drains your enthusiasm with the game the further you progress with it, due to how monotonous the whole gameplay loop gets. If the combat was completely enjoyable, the grind would be mostly fine, but because the gear system interferes so much with it, and the enemies are so poorly designed, it just doesn't really make for good longevity. I know I'm probably sounding quite harsh on the gameplay, and to a point, I definitely am. But it's only because the actual character movesets are so varied and great that it feels like there is a ton of missed potential because of all the flaws with the combat. The basic combat itself is great, and it's completely balanced and enjoyable when you're plodding through the main story content, but as soon as you start doing the multiplayer stuff and the loot systems and larger groups of enemies start emerging, the problems with the combat really show their face, which is a shame because for all intents and purposes, the multiplayer is where Crystal Dynamics and Square Enix want you to spend all of your time. There's a good framework there, it's just it's buried beneath tons of mediocre mechanics and restrictions that stop it from really reaching its full potential. Hopefully since this is a games as a service title, Crystal Dynamics will listen to player feedback and adjust and rehaul the things that didn't work with the gameplay to fix all the issues and really make the game shine. But as it is, at launch and several weeks after, it's difficult to find the, you know, urge to continue playing. Visually, the game is absolutely stunning, with everything from the lush environments to the insanely detailed character models all looking incredibly good for current gen standards, and I bet that it will look even better on next gen platforms, with the potential of ray tracing and other next gen benefits at their disposal. This one section of the game early on, when you're exploring the Utah Badlands for instance, is probably the best example for showcasing how good the environments look, both in terms of texture detail and resolution, as well as the render distance, level of detail quality, and anti-aliasing quality as it all looks natural, with very few blemishes. Though, like with most games, when you stop to actually take a closer look at it all, the imperfections in the asset quality do start to become a bit more noticeable. All of the locations in the game are consistent when it comes to visual fidelity, and are quite a spectacle to behold with mostly excellent texture and model quality across the board, with brilliant lighting, shadows and anti-aliasing that all help to bring it all neatly together in one beautiful package. Though admittedly, it does feel like there isn't much variety in terms of the locations themselves, at least in the multiplayer content, which makes the grind later in the game all the more tedious due to the similar environments, but I'll mention that in further detail when I get to the multiplayer portion. There are, however, plenty of different and unique locations in the single player story campaign that don't appear in the multiplayer portion, and these are for the most part better crafted and designed, with better layouts and plenty of variety. When it comes to the character designs, I personally really like the default versions of the characters, though I can see why other people might dislike them, as they do at times feel like they're discount versions of the Marvel Cinematic Universe iterations of the characters. Thankfully though, there are a ton of different costumes for each character that completely change up their appearance, so if you don't like a character's appearance, you can just try to unlock a costume that suits your preferences better. Though admittedly, there are quite a few costumes that are just basic recolors of others, and a lot of the better ones are locked behind microtransactions, which again I'll discuss later in this video. Enemy designs on the other hand are a bit more lacklustre, as while the bosses look great and are well designed visually, the regular enemy grunts that you encounter throughout the game are very generic and similar looking, with only a few unique enemy types and designs, mostly consisting of a small selection of aim robots, some of which are just recolors of others, 
or regular humans that whilst visually different from the aim forces, function pretty much the same on a gameplay level, at least from what I've seen. Hopefully when the story progresses in future content drops we'll get more interesting looking enemies, but at launch if there is one place where the game really drops the ball, it's with its enemy designs and how lacklustre they are. When it comes to the game's resolution, it largely varies depending on the platform as expected, but all versions of the game use a dynamic resolution that changes when the performance of the game starts to stumble. The PlayStation 4 Pro version of the game, which is the version I played, has two different performance options in the settings menu. They are 4K and Performance, with the 4K mode functioning at a locked 30 frames per second, aiming to display the game at an upscaled 4K resolution where possible, and the Performance mode unlocking the frame rate and displaying the game at a 1080p resolution. Both modes are good for the most part, but I honestly stuck with the 4K resolution for the most part, as like with most titles, I prefer a stable 30 frames per second over an unstable unlocked frame rate, and the game really does benefit from the better resolution, as it helps to really show off how good the game looks. For the other platforms, I believe the Xbox One X is similar to the PS4 Pro, but with a native 4K resolution and slightly more consistent frame rates, with similar performance options, whilst base platforms like the regular PS4 and Xbox One operate at much lower resolutions, at a dynamic resolution between 1080p and 720p at 30 frames per second. The PC version is for the most part flexible as expected, with a lot more graphical customizability. Sadly, the high graphical quality of the game comes at a huge cost, as it suffers from poor performance across most parts of the game on all versions of the game, both in terms of the consistency of its frame rate, the dynamic resolution, as well as general texture and object bugs and glitches. I even noticed that sometimes the subtitles didn't match what was actually being said by the voice actors, almost as if they had placeholder text that they forgot to change when rewriting the script mid-development. Thankfully, none of these issues are particularly game-breaking, and aside from a couple instances where objective crucial enemies got trapped in walls, requiring you to restart from the last checkpoint, most of the game is a relatively stable experience. On PC, PS4 Pro and Xbox One X. The regular PS4 and Xbox One versions, however, struggle to run the game at all and frame rate stability and overall graphical resolution quality suffers quite frequently during gameplay. You'll probably be able to get through the main story campaign fairly fine as frame rate dips are fairly less common there, but as soon as you enter any of the multiplayer mission types, the game will really start to chug, and it's not a particularly pleasant experience, especially during moments where there are a lot of enemies and special effects on the screen. It very much feels like a game that released a generation too early, and I'm fairly confident that the Xbox Series X and PS5 versions of the game will hopefully fix almost all of the performance issues that played the game, though we'll have to see for certain when those versions launch, because otherwise it's just piss poor optimization. Overall, when it comes to the graphics and performance of the game, I'd say I'm pretty mixed on it. Sure, graphically it looks incredible and most of the character and location designs are pretty great, with excellent texture and model quality, lighting, shadows and anti-aliasing, it's all pretty visually incredible. But the poor optimization on all platforms, especially base consoles, in terms of general performance, as well as the abundance of glitches and bugs that plague the game, drag it down and make it hard to recommend purely because of the lack of polish which really makes me wonder what the state of the game was like back in May when it was originally planned to release, and how bad it must have been to have warranted a delay then. Sure, it's a games as a service, so it's probably expected that most of these issues will be fixed at some point in the future, as the game is intended to be supported by the developers for several years to come, but I would have much preferred it if the game was released in a more polished state, with any upcoming patches and content drops focusing more on fleshing out and adding to the game's content, instead of focusing primarily on fixing the issues that played the game that shouldn't have been in the game to begin with. The music in the game is for the most part good and works well to make scenes more dramatic and fights feel a lot more epic, though at the same time it feels incredibly generic and somewhat by the numbers for an action game soundtrack. 
As someone who loves listening to video game soundtracks as I'm working or doing things, nothing in Marvel's Avengers soundtrack comes off as particularly memorable. What I mean by that is that all of the tracks sound the same, yet not in a way that's cohesive or positive to the overall experience. They just all kind of blend together and just sound bland and uninteresting. A lot of games use recurring melodies or motifs in multiple different tracks in order to make their soundtrack more emotionally captivating and memorable. For instance, a lot of Square Enix JRPGs like Final Fantasy and Kingdom Hearts do this, where they'll take parts of other tracks such as the prelude from Final Fantasy and integrate it into other songs to add an extra emotional connection to the track and also narratively bind that track to specific themes or events that stick with a player. Marvel's Avengers, despite all of the tracks sounding the same, does none of that, with no real iconic theming or memorable melodies that tie the songs together. And you can't use the whole Marvel Cinematic Universe inspiration as an excuse, because the Marvel Cinematic Universe tracks usually do that sort of theming, with, for instance, the Avengers films using the core Avengers theme throughout multiple different tracks to, you know, showcase the Avengers and create some really memorable moments, like for instance the portal scene in Endgame is only as good as it is because you've got that Avengers theme slowly reaching a crescendo at the start, and it really makes the scene a lot more emotionally driven because of it. I admit I'm probably being a bit harsh about my criticisms with the soundtrack, and for what it's worth it serves its purpose quite well, and it sounds great, which is perhaps all it needs to do but it's probably the most underwhelming soundtrack for a AAA title released this year because of just how unoriginal and uninspiring it is. Now, I'm not a professional composer, so take what I say next with a grain of salt, but if I were in the composer's position, I'd take a leaf out of other character action games like Devil May Cry and theme the soundtrack around the characters. Like, if you give each of the playable characters their own themes with unique musical styles, it would make the soundtrack itself a lot more interesting, as well as inject a lot more personality into the characters themselves. Imagine if Iron Man, for instance, had some heavy rock music as his theme music, similar to the licensed music tracks they used during the game's story to showcase his inflated ego. It would definitely feel a lot cooler to fly around the locations in the game kicking ass, with heavy rock music pumping in the background, than it does with the current game soundtrack. As another example, 4 could have music similar in style to games like God of War or Skyrim, with a very Nordic orchestral feeling that would make you really feel powerful as you're carving through swaths of enemies with your lightning powers. These are just a few suggestions though, but I feel like it would definitely make the soundtrack of the game a lot more interesting and help to better amplify each character's uniqueness, as music and sound is an important part of a game's design. Presentation is an important part of keeping people playing a video game, as well as, you know, giving them a good first impression of it. And you can have all of the gorgeous graphics in the world, but if the soundtrack doesn't engage the player and lacks personality, then the game will feel dull and lifeless, and at times that's exactly how Marvel's Avengers feels. The number of tracks on the soundtrack itself is severely lacking considering the amount of content in the game, as there are only 15 tracks listed on the game's official soundtrack, with a large portion of them only playing during the main story, leading to a lot of repetition, especially in the multiplayer portion of the game where you'll have to grind for about 15-20 to 20 hours just to max out a single character's gear set, which means you'll be hearing that same track over and over and over again. For comparison, Marvel's Spider-Man, which was a single player game that could be fully completed in about 15 to 20 hours, has 27 different tracks on its soundtrack, with a lot more cohesive theming, making it a much much more enjoyable auditory experience, as you had less repetition with its tracks, and they were more memorable, making for a much better auditory experience. Okay. I deserve it. Yeah, you're damn right you deserved it. Do the Avengers pose a danger to society? That was the question, Bruce. That was the question. Did you even check the science? 
Did you check it was a heist, seat? Bruce. No. We were outsmarted. No. The Terrigen reactor was unstable, <laughs> and you knew that. You knew that, and you still paraded it before the entire world. So what? We just give up? We didn't give up, Tony. We failed. At least I can admit that. No. No, we failed him. We failed him. When it comes to voice acting, it's, for the most part, pretty perfect, with the voice acting in the English dub in particular standing out to me as quite phenomenal, and all of the characters sound just like you'd imagine them to sound. When Captain America speaks, he sounds just like Captain America, and when Tony Stark speaks, he sounds like an inflated douchebag, so pretty on point, all things considered. The game also offers multiple language options, both in terms of dubbing and subbing, which is always nice to see, as it allows the game to be appreciated by a larger audience, those being English, French, German, Russian, Polish, Italian, Spanish, Brazilian, Portuguese, and Arabic, all of which have full subs and dubs, though Czech is also a language option, but it is restricted to only text and subtitles. Overall, the game's sound is just alright. The voice acting is great and does a great job of getting you invested in the characters and the dialogue, but the music is fairly generic and uninspired, and makes the game feel very immemorable and lacking in personality, which is a real shame. Now let's move on to the multiplayer component of the game, where a large portion of the content of the game resides. In terms of the content itself, you can play it either with AI companions, with friends, or through matchmaking. Though admittedly, for the most part, I stuck with the AI companions, as I only really play multiplayer with my friends, and most of them are only planning on getting the game for next-gen platforms due to performance concerns, which, to be fair, is completely understandable given what I've talked about so far. That being said, I'm pleased to say that the AI companions in Marvel's Avengers are for the most part pretty intelligent, and oftentimes better at the game than some of the people I've played with, holding their own in combat situations quite well, to the point that I can leave them to their own devices and they'll clear waves of enemies while I attempt to complete objectives. There is, however, a huge game-breaking issue with playing through the multiplayer content with AI companions, and that is that they cannot really contribute to certain objective types for whatever reason. In particular, control point based ones such as the ones where you have to try to hold points until a gauge timer fills. The worst offender though is the vault missions, where you have to find a shield vault and obtain the treasures within, as in order to unlock the vault you need to stand on a point until the gauge fills, with the gauge freezing whenever you leave the control zone. But the problem is, you'll need to leave the zone quite frequently as the room fills with mostly ranged enemies, and some of which will try to hack panels across the room to reset your progress, so you'll have to leave the area to try and stop them. The problem here comes from the fact that even if an AI ally is standing on the control point when you're not, it won't count, unlike if you had another actual player where it would count, and you can freely leave the zone to deal with the waves of enemies trying to stop you from fulfilling your objective, so it's an unfair disadvantage that really needs to be addressed. I also have had a lot of issues with the game's matchmaking itself when I was trying to test the actual multiplayer aspect of the game, and I completely failed to find a single party I could join for it, making me think that perhaps the matchmaking in the game is completely broken at the moment, which is definitely not good for a multiplayer focused game. The core method of progression in the multiplayer portion of Marvel's Avengers involves constantly obtaining better gear for your characters, as mentioned earlier, that will allow you to deal more damage to enemies and defend yourself from attacks. As such, a lot of the game is designed around a repetitive grind of taking part in missions, completing faction assignments, whilst also leveling your characters up and filling out their skill trees. That's not to say the grind is inherently bad, as in small doses the game is pretty fun to just pick up and play for an hour or so a day, as the mission types are all pretty fun for the most part, and the general content on offer is enjoyable, but the terrible gear system, repetitive soundtrack and enemy designs, as well as the issues I have with combat, make the grind feel all the more arduous the more you play. <laughs> 
I guarantee spend too long playing the game in one session and it will start to feel repetitive to the point where it just feels like a tedious slog and it will kill your entire interest in the game completely. In terms of other progression systems the game has aside from the character skill trees and gear systems, each character also has their own unique challenge card, similar in structure to something like Fortnite's Battle Pass system, which tasks players with completing daily and weekly tasks in order to progress in the card, unlocking costumes, resource packs, regular currency and premium currency. The problem with this system is that the amount of points you get from daily and weekly challenges is pitiful and it would probably take someone a full month or maybe even two before they clear just one character's card and that's only if they dedicate themselves to clearing every daily and weekly challenge as they reset. I'll mention why this is quite dubious and sketchy when I get to my discussion on the game's microtransactions and premium currency in a little bit, but it's really not a fun system, at least in its current implementation. The daily and weekly challenges themselves are designed to be the most unenjoyable and annoying of tasks too, consisting of overly specific stuff like kill 10 enemies with an 8 hit combo, which is surprisingly tricky to do when grunts die in less than 2-3 to three hits, and any enemy aside from that is difficult to hit into a combo due to not being able to stagger them and all of the flying projectiles knocking you out of it. It almost feels like most of the daily tasks are deliberately annoying and cumbersome to complete to aggravate you enough to spend money on completing the character card instead. In terms of multiplayer mission types, there are quite a few. First, there are drop zones, short 5-10 to 10 minute long missions where you have to finish a short objective, usually consisting of destroying objects, defending shield operatives and inhumans, or capturing points until a gauge is filled. There are quite a few different types in the game that can be completed and they are useful for completing some of the daily faction tasks and gaining decent gear if you don't have the time to do some of the longer content. There are also harm challenge rooms, which are easily the worst mission type in the game, where you're chucked into a fairly bland and visually bare room and tasked with beating waves and waves of enemies until the end. They probably would be fun and good ways to experiment with the combat if the problems I mentioned earlier with the combat didn't exist, but they do, and they just drag on forever and never feel rewarding. Then there are war zones, which are larger missions that consist of completing a series of drop zone objectives in a large open area, with additional side objectives such as rescuing shield agents or inhumans, opening chests, solving puzzles, and discovering hidden shield vaults spread across the area that all contain loot, encouraging exploration. These are quite fun for the most part, but I'm not sure there is enough location or objective variety to keep people wanting to play for long play sessions, especially since you'll want to collect every bonus objective to get better gear, which makes them feel more like tedious slogs and fun romps but they're a lot more rewarding than the drop zones, so they're not completely terrible. There are also shield vault missions, which are similar to war zones in the sense that you're in one large area with tons of side objectives to complete, but differ because they only have one sole objective. Find the shield vault hidden in the area and complete the objective within to access its treasures. These are alright, but as I mentioned earlier, Attempting to do them solo with AI companions can turn into a real nightmare if your gear is underleveled, though it does feel like you'll consistently get better gear from these mission types than most other ones, so the pain is somewhat worth it to progress. There are also aim hives, where you descend through several floors of an aim building, completing objectives, which, just like the rest of the content in the game, awards you with better gear and resources that improve your character's stats. These are quite fun challenges though, and are some of the more difficult content in the game and will definitely test your skills with whichever character you attempt the hive with, though the location the hives take place in is very lacking as once you've seen one hive, it feels like you've seen them all which factors quite heavily into how boring the grind is later on. Finally there are villain sectors, war zones with more poor objectives that culminate in a boss fight with one of the game's few bosses, usually either Taskmaster, Abomination or a giant AIM robot. These again are alright, but sadly the boss fights against Taskmaster and Abomination are absolutely dreadful, since 
the only real way to fight them is to just attack them until their stupidly large health bar eventually drops to zero. One time it took me 15 minutes to kill Abomination alone in a villain sector I attempted and I was at no danger of dying and I wasn't underleveled. It's just my punches barely did anything and there's no strategy to the fights, you just wail on them till they die. So yeah, these are probably the weakest warzone types in my opinion because they're just regular war zones with a crap fight tagged on to the end. In terms of location variety, for the most part you'll be spending most of your time doing objectives in one of four different biomes, each with day and night variants. These locations are visually nice and all feel different from one another with a desert biome, forest biome, ice biome and city biome, though the side objectives found in each one are all pretty much identical and only have slight variations. The locations themselves don't really change on repeated visits either, with the only difference I believe being side objective locations being changed, but even then how you access those side objectives is almost always the same anyway. A lot of missions will also take place in various aim lab locations, but for the most part they always look the same with little actual variety in layouts, with only about 2-3 room variations per objective type and since you'll be visiting these locations the most, as it's where drop zones, hives and some war zones take place, it all grows stale very quickly. For a game that will require you to grind for over 20 hours just to get one character anywhere near the level cap, there really needed to be more location variety to keep me interested as I was progressing through the game. Which is interesting, because there are several other biomes you visit during the game, but only through side quest chains that would have added to the multiplayer content variety if they had regular missions set in them, so it feels like a missed opportunity. Honestly, the biggest flaw that Marvel's Avengers has at the moment is that in its current state, with all the gameplay issues and lack of more variety to the content and visual designs, it can be a very tiring and unenjoyable experience the further into the game you get. It desperately needed an extra year of development before releasing to polish the game, both to better optimise the game for current gen platforms and reduce bugs, but also to add more depth to the content contained in the game itself, as well as to refine the combat to reduce all of the damage sponge enemies and the other issues I have with it. Because there is a really really good game here, it's just buried underneath piles and piles of junk and lack of content that drag it down. For every good thing this game does, it does twice as many things wrong, and the more you play of it, the more you realise that. Which brings us to one of the m other biggest disappointments about Marvel's Avengers, the microtransactions and just how awful the game's implementation of them are. Firstly, most of the microtransactions in the game are purely cosmetic, with most of the characters' unique costumes being locked behind surprisingly steep premium prices. These prices wouldn't be so bad if the premium currency was obtainable relatively consistently throughout gameplay, but the only way to obtain the premium currency in game, aside from spending real money, is from unlocking parts of a character's challenge card that reward you with it. The amount you get for fully completing a challenge card isn't even enough to purchase a single legendary character costume from the premium store, which makes it all feel a bit like a waste of time, considering just how long it takes to clear just one challenge card. On the topic of the challenge card system, as I mentioned earlier, the way the system itself is implemented is very dubious, as it requires a severe amount of time investment to grind to complete just one character's card, which for a lot of people who have full time jobs and other priorities is just going to be unfeasible, since as I mentioned earlier, whilst the weekly tasks are fairly doable, most of the daily challenges are tedious, vague and often rely on some really stupid character based tasks and the amount of progress you make on the card for doing them doesn't feel anywhere near worth the time investment to complete them. But it's alright guys, because you can use the premium currency to buy level skips that unlock parts of the challenge card without requiring to do the challenges. The problem here of course is that the only way to obtain the premium currency in game without using real money is by progressing with a card. So using the premium currency that you obtain through that to progress further with the card to get more currency feels like a waste of resources, so the whole challenge card system blatantly feels like a classic microtransaction trap of making the free process so tedious, pointless or unenjoyable in order to try to urge you to spend real money to get the premium currency instead. <laughs> 
Sure, the argument can be made that you don't need to feel so bad about it because it's only cosmetic items locked behind the grind and paywalls, but the issue is that whilst the game itself has a lot of different costumes anyway that can be unlocked through progress, and the regular currency, a lot of them are just recolors of other costumes and a lot of them feel cheap and worthless. I don't want five different versions of Captain America covered in medical guff with the only difference being different colored trousers. I want the unique skins like Thor dressed as a 70s rocker or Hulk in a gladiator outfit and from what I've seen so far those are only available from the premium store. It admittedly isn't the biggest deal in the world, I'll admit that much, but it doesn't half make my full price £50 or $60 purchase feel somewhat lacking when I can't access a good portion of the unlockable content without shelling out more money on top of that. Overall, when it comes to the multiplayer portion of the game, I'm kinda disappointed. Most of the mission types themselves are quite enjoyable, despite the minor gripes I had with each one, but without more location variety, it all grows very stale very quickly, especially with the issues I had with the combat in full effect. It might also be that the game's multiplayer works best with friends to help make the tedium a bit more enjoyable, as playing it alone with AI companions can be incredibly dull and depressing, especially the further you progress with the game. Though, unless you have a group of friends with the game available, your only choice at present is the AI companions, due to the broken matchmaking systems that hopefully will be fixed sooner rather than later. The microtransactions aren't the worst I've seen in a video game, far from it, since at least you can access all of the gameplay content without worry, but at the same time the way they are presented in the game feels like a constant reminder that even though you bought the game, you'll never have these cool outfits without spending more, and it just feels a bit predatory. It's honestly a real shame though, cause there is a good framework to it all, it just needs some desperate refinement to make it an actual enjoyable experience. One thing that's important to note about Marvel's Avengers is that this isn't going to be the end of the game, rather it's the beginning and it's going to be evolving as time progresses from huge content patches that add new heroes and story content, both in terms of the main story and side character specific story chains, as well as general community and seasonal events that attempt to draw players back in and keep them engaged. Obviously the most interesting thing about these updates is the speculation on what heroes will be added to the game next and so far only a couple have been outright confirmed by Crystal Dynamics through their fairly frequent War Table reveal streams. The first hero slated to be added to the game sometime in the near future is Kate Bishop, who for those who don't know is essentially a female version of Hawkeye, with the main story portion added simultaneously with her release, focusing on her investigations into the disappearance of Hawkeye. The second hero to be added will be Hawkeye himself, coming soon after Kate and will presumably conclude the storyline involving the two characters. In terms of how Hawkeye and Kate differ, considering they have mostly the same moveset and general aesthetical theming, is unknown, but if I were to predict, I'd say they'll have one or two unique special attacks and mostly different cosmetics, but will mostly play the same. I, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, mind, as I think it's a neat way to get around situations in multiplayer where players want to play as the same character, but can't because someone else has already chosen them. We do also know that Spider-Man is coming to the Avengers in the future, but only exclusively to the PlayStation 4 and 5 versions of the game. I assume based on vague confirmations given by Crystal Dynamics because of the unique relationship between Sony and Marvel with regards to the rights of Spider-Man. We don't really know much aside from that, but based on the fact he'll be a platform exclusive character, it's fair to say he won't really have any real relevance in the main story of the game, at least unless they add him to other platforms in the future. In terms of substantial post-game content, the developers have revealed that there will be several new mission types added to the game over the course of the first month or so, the first being Mega Hives, a single player mission set where you're tasked with completing hives, with the unique mechanic being that you can only play as a single character, with the rest of the characters acting as your extra lives, so when you die you switch out to the next character in your roster until you run out of characters to switch to. It's an interesting challenge that will test players' skills as each of the characters to their limit, provided that some of the hive modifiers aren't unreasonably unfair, like that one I mentioned earlier that buffs ranged attacks to the point that you'll be one-shot. 
I can't really cover it in this video though because it's right at the end of the game's content in terms of item power level, and since I'm pacing myself with the game so that grinding doesn't kill my interest in the game, it'll probably be a while before I reach that content myself, especially since maxing out a single hero's power level usually takes anywhere from 20 to 30 hours alone, let alone multiple heroes, so I apologise for that but I'm probably not going to be able to cover it until next year. There is also secret lab missions which are only accessible once a week and are designed for people that have reached the game's current power level cap of 150. The AIM secret lab is similar in scope to an MMORPG raid, in the sense that you and three other people must go through a large dungeon completing objectives and light puzzle solving to reach the boss at the end. Interestingly the boss you fight at the end of the raid is determined by how well you and your team perform during the raid itself, which is quite a cool mechanic but since most of the boss fights in the game are utter garbage, unless they pull a new boss or two out of their hat for it, it's going to probably be a lacklustre conclusion, regardless of which boss you fight. Again, I can't really cover it in more detail here due to not being anywhere near close to the level cap yet, but I might come back and cover some of this content in a video later down the line when more post-game content is added. In terms of other post-game content, as of writing this video we don't really know much more than that. Aside from Black Panther coming at some point in the future, as it was teased during a recent War Table stream, but the actual announcement itself was delayed due to the tragic passing of Chadwick Boseman, the actor who portrayed the character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, so when he'll be properly announced and or released is anyone's guess. As I'm writing this video, more and more updates have been released for the game, with the latest patch 1.07 fixing a whole bunch of problems with the game, including some quality of life issues and vital bug fixes, with full patch notes available for viewing from their website. And from what they've expressed through social media, it sounds like they're determined to clean up all of the rough edges the game has and keep everyone informed about it, which is somewhat commendable, but makes me think the game should have been delayed an extra month instead to avoid all of this. But yeah, I guess the staying power of Marvel's Avengers is going to depend on the quality of the future content, so hopefully they'll be able to release regular hero and story updates will keep people interested for a long while, but at the moment, I definitely think if this game plans on persisting for a long time with a decent player base, it drastically needs to adjust the combat to fix the issues I mentioned earlier, as well as actually making collecting gear an enjoyable experience, because as it is, I can see a lot of people dropping off the game very quickly before too long, even if new characters and story threads drop, purely because of how monotonous a large chunk of the experience feels. Overall, I'd probably say my experience with Marvel's Avengers was quite mixed. The general framework of the game from the graphics, the character gameplay, the main story and the mission types are all absolutely great, but the rest of the game, such as the generic music, terrible enemy designs in the rubbish gear system, to the scummy microtransactions and terrible performance, drag the game down something awful, and it turns it from an entertaining and enjoyable adventure with Earth's Mightiest Heroes into a tedious monotonous slog. The main story was a really fun and entertaining narrative that can stand quite well alongside some of the better Marvel Cinematic Universe films, with some really good dialogue and interesting story progression despite most of the twists in the story being admittedly quite predictable, and some characters receiving little character development despite their importance. The multiplayer aspect of the game isn't outright terrible, and there is some fun to be had with it, especially if you have friends to enjoy it with, as the mission types and general structure is good, but the location variety, poor combat balancing and tedious slog drags it down quite a lot to the point that your enjoyment will start to deteriorate rapidly as you progress through it. The microtransactions as well are absolutely awful and sure, most of them are just cosmetic, but this sort of business model only feels fair for free to play games or budget titles, where the consumer hasn't already spent over £50 or $60 for the game itself. I'm not saying it should all just be free, but if they had made it a bit easier to collect the premium currency in the game itself, perhaps as a reward for completing some of the harder content, it would feel a lot more tolerable. The question is though, do I recommend purchasing Marvel's Avengers, and if so, what price point would I consider the game in its current state to be worth? Well, first of all, the game looks and runs fairly terribly on the base Xbox One and PS4 platforms, 
so I really can't recommend buying those versions at all, as the flaws found in the game are exemplified a lot worse in those versions of the game, and I'm uncertain whether Crystal Dynamics will bother really optimising or fixing those versions of the game when they're focused more on fixing general bugs, getting the next gen versions ready for launch, and working on future content for the game. The PlayStation 4 Pro, Xbox One X and PC versions however do run a lot better, both in terms of frame rate and resolution making for a much more positive experience. And I'm certain the next gen versions for PS5 and the Xbox Series X will probably run the best when they release. That being said, I still struggle to recommend it in its current state to anyone except hardcore Marvel fans. The problems with it are plenty and though I enjoyed a good portion of the game for many hours, the flaws I began to notice and experience during the latter half of my time with the game negatively influenced the hours I did enjoy, leading to an overall average experience. Don't get me wrong, it isn't a bad game, not at all. It's just a good game that's being buried by bad design and hopefully over time all of that potential will be uncovered and I can fully recommend the game to everyone interested in it rather than just to the hardcore Marvel fans. It very much feels like a game that is mediocre now, but could be great in the future depending on what the developers do with it next. Until that time though, this has been my review of Marvel's Avengers. I'll probably come back to it at some point in the future as a follow up video to see where the game is at that point, and after more content is released for it, and whether my opinion of the game has changed at all. If you like this video be sure to like and subscribe to support the channel, and comment below with your thoughts and feelings on Marvel's Avengers and whether you like the game or not and why. I'm curious to hear what you all think. Until next time though, this has been Kingdom H, and thanks for watching.